Rebuilding a Stuart 5A steam engine. This is part two. Cleaning the parts and checking the fits. And here's a spare crankshaft. Not something that you normally have laid about in your workshop, but I have. This was a new old stock crankshaft that I bought. And it's very useful for comparing fits with a micrometer. It speeds everything up. So instead of taking a measurement from the crankshaft that's with this engine, and then looking at all the numbers, then comparing the micrometer readings with the numbers on the drawing for a 5A, which of course I don't have, this just makes it a whole lot easier. A micrometer one, and then move on to the second one, and compare the micrometer readings. And now, without fear of contradiction or criticism, I can compare crankshaft number one, the brand new one, with crankshaft number two, and the good news is, crankshaft number two that belongs to this engine is perfect. In fact, the only difference between these two crankshafts is the presence of a hole here and also a hole here. There is a way through from one hole to the other, so any oil applied to the crankshaft main bearing automatically finds its way down to the big end bearing. Very ingenious. This crankshaft does not have this facility, and I'm certainly not going to try and drill a hole at that angle all the way through that mass of hard metal. But what I'm going to do is check the concentricity of the crankshaft. And it's currently in my lathe, and I'm using this gadget, which is called a dial test indicator. And basically it's a plunger, and as the plunger moves in and out, it gives a clock reading. So I've set it to zero, and when I rotate the crankshaft, you can see that the crankshaft is not true. Oh, shock horror. It's at least one thou out. But really, I think we can live with this. One thou over that distance is not much at all. It's worth bearing in mind that this is just a one and a half horsepower simple steam engine. It doesn't go very fast. It is not a supercar. It does not tear around a track. And it does not need to have the tolerances of a modern supercar. Even when I use the DTI or dial test indicator near the end of the crankshaft, the reading is still pretty good. And now, from the sublime to the ridiculous. I've already mentioned in the last episode that the top cap is broken. This cast iron part is definitely not good. In fact, even with some cyanoacrylate adhesive, it's not wanting to go back together. But eventually, I got it precisely where I needed it to be and clamped it tightly in the vise until the cyanoacrylate adhesive cured. Now, I'm fully aware that this is not a difficult part to make. I need to get a casting from Stuart's, machine it, and then we have a working top cap again. But I just thought to myself, I wonder if this will work. And I've nothing to lose, really. I do like to experiment now and again. And if it doesn't work, I will just remachine a new part. So let the experiment begin. Igor, fetch me the brain. Or is it Igor? Young Frankenstein's the better film, I think. So I drilled two holes all the way through the casting from the outer edge down to the middle of the casting. And then I reamed these holes one eighth of an inch diameter. And then... I needed two very, very strong one eighth of an inch diameter pins to put into the holes with some Loctite 638. The shank diameter of an 8BA tap is one eighth of an inch exactly, and this is very, very hard steel. Most of these are high speed steel, and most of them are broken. So I selected a couple of broken 8BA taps, and I ground off the tap part and ground the other end so that I ended up with two dowels. These were then pressed into the holes with some Loctite 638. And that's all I've got to say on this subject for the moment. During the build, if the thing breaks, then I will remachine apart. If it doesn't, then it's obviously going to be fine. We shall see. Moving swiftly on before all the proper engineers and meticulous people out there quickly reach for the keyboard to send me death threats, I'm now going to prepare to paint this engine. And if anyone out there really likes painting, you're in for a treat, because there's a lot of painting on this engine. And I personally am quite excited about painting this engine. I can't wait to paint this engine. So I'm working with a passion to remove any old paint that's not where it's supposed to be, ready to paint it the correct colour. Because this is Mammod Green. Now there's nothing wrong with Mammod Green if it's on a Mammod steam engine. This is supposed to be a proper engine, so a Stuart 5A masquerading as a Mamod is just unacceptable. And I'm being picky in this instance. I really am sort of shocked by this. So I can't wait to lose this paint forever and paint it the correct colour. What is the correct colour of a 5A, I hear you ask? Well, really, I don't know. It's olive drab, maybe. 
Or is it Brunswick Green, the same colour as the Land Rover? Or is it British Racing Green? You could buy some paint from Stuart's, so that's called Stuart Models Green, but that's changed over the years. And from what I can gather, because I work on a lot of these engines, the most popular choice for painting a Stuart model was Humbrol Green, Gloss Number 3. So I will paint this with Humbrol Green, Gloss Number 3. But for the moment, I'm just keying up the old paintwork. The old paintwork's pretty good. Whoever did this did quite a good job, put plenty of paint on. Unfortunately, the paint did go in places where it wasn't required, but that's now slowly been removed. It is quite important to make sure that you do not have paint on the mating surfaces. Most of these need to be clean cast iron to cast iron. That way, the alignment will be perfect, or at least as machined. If there's a big lump of paint underneath the cast iron, it could throw the alignment of certain parts out. Not enough to make a big difference, but enough to just stiffen up the engine. So I'm taking great pains to scrape off any paint from any of the cast iron mating surfaces. And to be perfectly honest, this is becoming a bit of a chore. I think I've got all the paint off, then I see some more. Small areas of paint are lurking around every corner. Ordinarily, I would skip some of this detail, and indeed I have done. What I'm doing here is not 100% of the job. I'm just leaving enough in to show how utterly tedious this job is. And also, I'm degreasing the parts as I go. For this, I'm using a mixture of lighter fuel and white spirit. I'm also, at the same time, cleaning off dubious substances on the bearings. I don't know what this stuff is. It's sort of a latex feel. It's as though someone stuck the bearing in with some glue. And I don't know why they want to do that, because when I remove all this mess, the bearing fits perfectly well without it. But cell V, that's the way it is. And while I think on, this is a green engine, and you will also see me using some green scouring pads. These are actually scouring pads. It's called Scotch Bright, and it's like a more abrasive version of the pan scourers that you buy. And it's really good for cleaning up pieces of metal, and it's also good for keying paint, like you've just seen here. And once again, I missed a bit of the paint that was left on the cast iron surfaces. I can safely say I'm losing the will to live at this point. The high point being that now I'm using a piece of sandpaper to clean up the bearing brass. It's not really brass, it's gunmetal, but they're called bearing brasses. Brass is no good at all, by the way, just in case anybody doesn't know this. Brass makes a terrible bearing material because it wears out prematurely. Phosphor bronze is far better, but I prefer the free cutting phosphor bronze just for the record. The phosphor bronze that is a dark red colour is horrible to machine. The number of reamers and drills that I've broken in the past by using this material, I don't like to think about it. And another material to avoid, while on the subject of materials to avoid, for me, I would always try and avoid alum bronze or aluminium bronze because it's extremely hard and it's horrible to machine with the equipment you normally find in the home workshop. If you don't believe me, try it. Well, that's about it because I get fed up after a bit and I really am fed up for doing this and there's a lot more to come, but not too much of this. There is, of course, the painting episode to look forward to. You really will like that. You really will. And now it's time to go and take my medication and lock myself in a dark room for several hours. So thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.